The Corporation for Earth Media is proud to present this educational program. Produced in conjunction with the frontier scientists, engineers, and artists of the Kronos 7 expedition. South Scrimshaw is made possible through the support of viewers like you. Thank you. sunlight shines through the veined membrane of an aquatic egg. It was once carried in deeper, cooler waters of a more northern latitude. Now it bobs freely in a subtropical shallow. The consciousness dawning inside is prodded alert in discomfort. It is a male whale calf, stirring with a newfound awareness of body. This pod has held him for 17 months, nurtured his development from a single fertilized cell. Now it can no longer support his life. The inflow of nutrients and oxygenated blood has ceased. A once comfortable cradle now pinches at his enlarged form. Pushed onto his own faculty, a suffocating urge to thrash wells up inside him. Yet he hesitates. A song booms from the world outside. The powerful low frequency vibrates through his whole body. With the certainty of deep imprinting, the calf knows who is calling. It is his mother. She is on the other side. He must join her. The shell containing him is now only a brittle husk, swollen with waste material and straining at the seams. Clumsy first movements form the start of the calf's motor awareness. The egg is evolved to rupture open along a central seam. A few thin cartilage bands are all that retain him. One more forceful effort and he will escape. Technically speaking, the whale didn't hatch from an egg. Egg is something of a misnomer. While there are known egg-laying mammals, none of them are whales. There are four extant species of egg-laying mammal. They are... The platypus. The echidna. The snorb. And the ribbon snore. This whale species has a placental connection to the mother while developing. Birthing shell is the term currently favored in scientific journals when discussing this style of external womb. The outer cartilage folds backwards, shrinking the space inside and expelling the contents outwards creating pressure against the inner membrane until it finally pops. The calf spills out into the open ocean. The world is a rush of sensory stimulation. The newborn is momentarily stunned limp. He comes to amid a dizzying flurry of life. Plants and protists tangle and snag his every movement. Small scavengers eagerly devour the cloud of waste. Plants unfurl and retract in almost animalistic locomotion. Foliage clings to the calf from above. He swims deeper to escape. His mother's song reassures him once again, but she is still nowhere in sight. Sponges, wolf biters, crustaceans and corals dangle from the plants like ornaments. Plant is not a misnomer. 
These are true plants. As with so much else in biology, the origin of plants can be traced back to the water. Albeit those early ancestors were far less complex than what we see today. As will be explained later, marine environments impose steep challenges on plants. It was once upon land freed from the burdens of an aquatic life that plants could more readily diversify and form. And it was also after that great proliferation of flowering species that some plants found it more favourable by the water and eventually returned to the seas. They are, in that sense, like whales. Something solid grabs from below. His descent is halted. He's being lifted back towards the surface. The calf breaches, filling his lungs with their first breath of air. This is the breeding ground of his species. At the year's peak, this wide expanse fills with whales. But today our calf finds the surface empty. Except for a very odd clump of plants. The calf does not know what to make of it. Equally disturbed and compelled, he stares transfixed. Plants continue to tickle his body just below the water. A resident waterbug examines him with equal skepticism. Sudden movement atop the leafy mass catches his eye. It's all too frightening for the little one. He retreats back under the surface. His overpowering instinct is to nurse, but he cannot. His exhaustion mounts and fear seizes him. He is lost. And as if sensing his weakness, tendrils begin to grasp at him. A vine lassos his flute. There is no escape. In a final burst of strength, the calf fights, thrashing, tearing and uprooting his attackers. A scent of blood enters the water. His mother cries a pained song to soothe him. The calf is hit with the sudden realization. The strange plants are not taking him away from his mother. strange plant clod is his mother. What evidence remained of this year's Brillo breeding season has long since been swept away. This sandbar has returned to its normal pristine state. Save for one unusual pile of rocks. This is a stone dog. Somewhat like a hermit crab, this animal lives in a portable shelter of foreign material. It grasps together a shell of scavenged of debris with its long limbs and secrets an adhesive mucus to hold it fast. Stone dogs mostly rely on ambushing prey from a camouflaged position. 
Right now, this stone dog here is not the hunter, but the hunted. It is a woefully obvious attempt to hide. As the predator stalking it possesses one of the sharpest minds in the ocean. A quick check if the coast is clear. It isn't. Our whale calf wants to play, not eat. But from the stone dog's perspective, there's little difference. Since hatching, our calf has been a healthy and energetic specimen. Despite his late birth, no complications are detectable. If anything, his cognitive ability is showing swift advancement. He is very fond of holding his fluke above the water surface. Scattered showers are currently moving through the area. The calf has been emerging frequently for visual inspection since the rain began. He seems very interested in the weather above. The long call reminds him not to stray too far. Brillos have surprisingly keen vision above the water. The calf is quickly able to spot his mother. This is the farthest distance he has traveled from her. It is more than twice that of yesterday. Today was quite an adventure. Now, reminded of his mother, all this bravery seems to evaporate. He is suddenly anxious to be at her side. He will bring her any interesting objects discovered while exploring. And boot it at her face. His mother is trying to rest off another bout of nausea. This play is a bit much. But these discomforts are trivial to the bond between mother and child. Our neural interface even shows a measurable relief in her symptoms during these interactions. The calf's carefree play is training for future hunts and the essential skills of survival. But it will be some time before he has to worry about earning meals on his own. His mother's long prehensile udders reach him through the thorny bramble. The milk he nurses on is thick as yogurt. Calves subsist on this fat-rich diet for two years, building up an insulating layer of blubber and the bands of spongy tissue for other organisms to burrow into. Here we arrive at what truly makes a Brillo whale such a remarkable specimen for study. Symbiosis of unrivaled complexity and variety. This female was initially selected for study due to her exquisitely beautiful exterior. The mammal is almost totally concealed within the undulating botanical mass. In cross-section, the distinction between whale and passenger is more visible. Unlike the stone dog shown earlier, this is not simply an external attachment of foreign material. The Brillo whale has an intimate connection to thousands of other living creatures. The whale chooses from among a variety of partner species and offers real estate within designated regions of its body. An inner membrane draws the line between the welcome cohab. This unusual arrangement raises several questions, the first of which we will address. What is the benefit of living on a whale? To help us illustrate the principle, we will be assisted by a sea bunny, or sea bun, to use its more common nickname. While each species has its own unique adaptation to this niche lifestyle, we can create several broad categories of benefits such evolution aims to harness. Moving through water takes energy. It is far easier to travel great distance when someone else is doing the swimming. 
Simply hitching a ride can be greatly beneficial. For example, one species of crab only lives on Brillo whales every other generation and uses whale transportation to greatly expand its range. Unless one is the apex predator, the threat of being eaten is an ever-present reality. If one lives as a potential meal, it is very important to be the least desirable, most difficult of meals. Finding alliance with a giant beast and living under its protection creates a very effective deterrence. It's always still possible to be eaten, but hunters now risk facing off with a leviathan. Some partnerships are more proactive. Certain shark, skates, rays and scarps have formed hunting partnership with the brillos. They help find and catch quarry, then share in the feast. Pack hunting allows the brillo to take down larger and different sorts of prey. The blood or waste of brillo whales can also provide a source of nourishment. This not offered freely. Obviously, a brillo whale cannot stand to be eaten alive. An earth parallel is an oxpecker bird on a rhinoceros. The bird may drink a marginal amount of blood while it cleans off ticks. It's a fair trade for the rhinoceros, as the tick is the far greater threat. So too will a brillo whale expend blood in a beneficial relationship. In several instances, living on a brillo has evolved into part of an organism's life cycle, and the specific conditions regulated in a brillo's body are required for a new generation. In some cases, this goes even further. With the biology of the two species becoming so enmeshed, it is unclear where one ends and the other begins. But these instances are rare. Our research team is very interested if these extreme cases represent a functioning system or the path of all of these riders taking in small amounts adds up to a great expense for the host. This prompts the obvious next question. What does the whale stand to benefit from this arrangement? This is more complicated to respond to. There seems to be as many answers as there are Brillo whales, as there is spectacular variety among Brillos. For now, let us approach the answer with specific examples from this mother. The most prominent feature along her body is the wide variety of photosynthesizing organisms. The whale is, of course, not an autotroph producing her own energy from sunlight. But the specialized sea flora pays rent by sharing some of their sugars into her blood. When light is low, roots ferment and alcohol is also created as a byproduct. Certain plants near her head also act as fishing lures, drawing food to her more. While she may occasionally swim deeper, a partially plant-subsidized life has locked her within the photic zone the upper aquatic layer where enough sunlight can sustain the leaves. Adult Brillo behavior and biology is often dramatically influenced by their symbiotic arrangement. Here we see a blood trilobite. This is not an invited guest. A long needle-like proboscis pushes down and taps a vein. Drinking in great volume and offering nothing in return, it is a true parasite. This is a job for the vellum worm. Vellum worms fill their stomachs by grooming brillos of unwanted visitors. It is currently hypothesized that vellum worms distinguish the welcome from the attackers through smell and taste. Parasites have all been found to have elevated amounts of a bile-like brillo waste inside them. This mother brillo also has to worry about creatures browsing her lovely plants. Herbivorous fish attempt frequent raids on the leafy goods. This one is alone and quite oblivious. The vellum worm packs a powerful punch for larger animals. A neurotoxin-filled barb is shot into the fish's heart. It can only manage a faint muscle spasm before the venom completes its work. The Brillo whale strategy is called a symbiotic garden. It is an intentionally cultivated arrangement and a precarious balance of mutual reliance. When successfully maintained, the host becomes a morass of life. It is usually defended from attack. It can sometimes acquire energy in novel ways, and occasionally it is able to invade new niche ecosystems.
universal downside experienced by all Brillos is that more complexity creates more points for failure. An adult Brillo's life is dominated by the struggle to groom a semblance of order into increasingly overgrown flanks. To a simple calf, these adult problems have yet to enter his mind. Today he has found his mother's leaves serve as fun streamers to play with. She finally scolds him. She is too unwell to tolerate any more rough housing. He doesn't quite understand, but he has other diversions. Primarily drinking more of her milk. Given the complexity of Brillo anatomy, even small health problems can swiftly spiral out of control. This female experienced complications while giving birth. There is the potential for the situation to worsen. A thorned branch has become ingrown, puncturing through both the layer of protective outer muscle and the cuticle barrier. This had begun prior to carving, but her contractions to extend the womb also caused the plant shard to stab deeper. The spikes are now in contact with her intestines. Fortunately, there is no puncture yet. The site is inflamed and white blood cells flood the area. The immune system unmistakably identifies this as an injury. We can witness her stiff reluctance to move and read a jolt in brain activity when she's jostled. It must be greatly painful. The greatest danger right now is a tear of the intestines, which would certainly be fatal. There is reason to hope. Our scans also reveal that she has recovered from a similar injury in the past. Perhaps Brillos regularly endure such ghastly wounds. Perhaps it was the safety of the Brillo herd which afforded her enough time to convalesce. Certainly her odds of survival will be boosted greatly if she is able to make the long swim back. For now, she is still well enough to care for her newborn, though doing so must be exhausting. Judging by several physical indicators, this is most likely her first calf. Those Brillos who manage their gardens well can be extremely long-lived. Females can give birth as many as eight times. If the calf survives, one day he too might also cast his genes forward, his own minute fingerprint on the future's shape. Regardless of whatever metric of success we observers of an outside species might apply, his life will be led by the means it was forged in the crucible of natural selection. But for now, a rare moment of shelter.